please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Well, debt-ridden Fortis Healthcare now has three suitors with Hero Enterprises Investment Office and the Berman family entering the fray. Remember, Manipal hospitals backed by private equity TPG were the first ones to express interest. Now, even as the consortium is working on sweetening the deal, there was an unsolicited offer from the Malaysian hospital chain IHH. Nisha Podda now joins in with the very latest on that. So, Nisha, two new players in the race. So it's only heating up. Nisha, can you hear me? Yeah. I don't think... Ron, this is Ekta. Nisha, oh, go ahead. Okay, Ekta. All right, sorry. <laughs> I was told it's Nisha. Go ahead, Ekta. Is yes. this a bit of a... The race is clearly heating up. Now you've got two new players in this. What could this really mean? Uh, well, you know, uh, actually, this, act, uh, this is becoming very interesting because now we have different... Uh, offers which are coming in for different prices, but it seems as, to the, as though the range of the investment is still somewhere between 155 to 160. So Manipa's revised offer stood at 155 rupees per share. We have uh, the latest offer which is coming from the Hero in, uh, Investment Office as well as the Berman Family Office, which stands at around 156 rupees per share. And we had IHH where there were rumors today and reports. Uh, uh, saying that, you know, they would probably look at around 160 rupees per share. Now, having said that, the 1,250-odd crores that the Munja, that the family, the Hero Plus Berman family is offering at this point in time is basically, again, broken up between two things. 500 crores, which would be probably an immediate infusion into the company, and 750 crores, which would be based on due diligence. So that means that if they are... Um, happy with the due diligence, which should be completed in three weeks, only then will they invest an additional 750 crores. So 500 crores is based on the fact that they want it to be used immediately in terms of uh, the lack of liquidity that the company is facing, but that 750 crores is contingent on a due diligence. Now remember that the offer that Manipal is offering at this point in time is a binding offer with the legal structure post due diligence. So that's where the difference comes in that despite the pedigree that you're talking about with the Munjas as well as the Berman family, uh, you are still talking about 750 crores coming in with contingency of a due diligence. Uh, so it will be interesting to see how exactly it goes forward. But, um, and we're still to hear from Fortis about a particular IH bit that they might have received. So it'll be, uh, so it'll be interesting to line all three of them up and compare, but as of now, um, what you can clearly say is that the hero as well as uh, the Munjal, the Munjal yeah. family as well as Berman is a binding plus a non-binding component, component in it. All right, Ekta, I would request you to hang in there. We now have Nisha also uh, uh, on the line. Nisha, you heard Ekta. Anything more you can tell us since this is a story that you've also been tracking for several weeks? Oh, yes, uh, Rana Joy. So, uh, yes, Ekta has summarized it uh, perfectly well and has also mentioned that it is, uh, you know, binding as well as non-binding, which is extremely important to note at this point. Now, it will not only, um, uh, you know, take care of the interim requirements of funds of Fortis, but what it will also do is that make um, Burman as well as uh, the Munjal family and their, uh, uh, their enterprises uh, which are investing into the company, the single largest holder in Fortis Healthcare in the absence of a clear um, uh, promoter of the company. So that's an important point to note. The press release that uh, states uh, that, uh, you know, they have uh, given quotes from both Munjal as well as Mr. Berman, and they say that it will go beyond uh, addressing the urgent liquidity needs of the company and it can help the operations uh, stabilize with immediate effect. Do not sound off that they are in any way looking at buying out Fortis Healthcare, but they do want uh, a board position as well because of the money that they are giving. Now, remember, if the entire amount of 1,250-odd crore rupees is given in preferential allotment at the current market price, this particular investment may hold over 16% stake, and they already have over 3% stake. So they could be the single largest, and they can really rule the roost when it comes to deciding the final buyer 
while IHH as well as Manipal and TPG, on the other hand, are really slugging it out to buy out Fortis Healthcare. So we really don't know the intention at this point. Right. It doesn't look like it that yeah. they are looking at a buyout of Fortis Healthcare, but want to really gain from the kind of competition that is taking place there. All right, great perspective, guys. Nisha, Ekta, thanks very much for joining us on India Business Hour this late evening with the very latest on that. We'll also try and connect with Sunil Kant Munjal, the man who's actually thrown in his hat in the ring. Meanwhile, following rumors of a possible deal between Ola and Uber India, we learned from sources that Uber's global CEO, Barney Harford, will be making his maiden India visit next week. Priya Shade brings us all the details. So, Priya, take us through what's on his agenda and why is this trip significant? Well, following Uber's global CEO Dara Koshrashai's visit to India in February 2018, we learned from sources that Uber's COO Barney Harford will be making his maiden visit to India next week. Now, we do understand from our sources that the agenda of his visit to India will be to discuss key business strategies as well as operational metrics uh, that will boost a business as far as the Indian market is concerned. We understand that the COO will be also meeting several state as well as central governments government officials on business developments and plan uh, for the India market going forward is also likely to meet investors to discuss the roadmap and the strategy that they will follow in this very price sensitive market. Now we also do understand that the Uber's global COO will be meeting with employees and will be holding a town hall in his visit uh, between uh, April 17th to 20th is what we are uh, picking up but of course he will be making multiple visits uh, to cities like Delhi as well as Bangalore in this very uh, short trip uh, that has been planned. Now do remember that the timing of this visit is very interesting because it follows rumors or reports of a possible alliance or a merger between uh, Ola as well as Uber India and uh, this is something that we will uh, keep an eye out for. Of course we did reach out to Uber India and the company has confirmed that uh, Barney Harford will be visiting India next week. India is a core market for Uber globally. They've also said that Barney is looking forward to meeting business as well as government leaders in the country and discussing ways uh, Uber can better partner with riders, drivers as well as cities. Right, Priya, thanks a lot for that. Now, let's take a look at developments coming in from the aviation space. Uh, expanding Vistara is our priority. However, we will keep our options open with respect to the proposed uh, divestment of Air India. That was Singapore Airlines' response to a CNBC TV18 query on whether they plan to acquire the debt-laden Air India. Now, remember, the last date for submission of expression of interest for Air India is the 14th of May. Ashpreet Sethi, who has been speaking to several airlines regarding their interest in Air India, joins us now. Ashpreet, uh, Singapore Airlines hasn't ruled this option out. Where do the others stand as of now? It has been a week of denials from airlines with no takers for the Maharaja. In fact, Indigo was the first airline to give a formal expression of interest and the first to rule out their bids for the new Air India. Now look at it, Jet Airways, Spice Jet, all of them are saying that they will not be looking at participating in the Air India divestment for now. CNBC TV18 wrote to foreign airlines and the first to deny any investment was Dubai-based Emirates. In fact, look at Lufthansa and uh, British Airways as well. They are saying that they would not like to comment on market speculation about their talks with the government and the Indian corporates to buy a stake in the national carrier. Now, the only saving grace that the government has right now is Singapore Airlines because they've gone ahead and said that they're keeping their options open regarding this ambitious divestment along with their expansion plans for Vistara. Now, while some experts say that it could be pressure tactics by these airlines to dilute or sweeten the existing bid terms, the government seems to be firm with it and they're saying that they will go ahead with it for now. Sources in the industry, however, suggest that the most scathing one, the term that is they're looking at, is taking over the 33,000 odd crore debt and that needs to be revised immediately, taking over a large employee base and the government retaining its 24% stake are also a concern. Now, it remains to be seen if the government will relax the bid terms to lure the airlines that have given a thumbs down for now. All right, Ashpreet, many thanks to Singapore Airlines. They're keeping the cards close to its chest, not saying that they are interested, but at the same time, they're not denying it either. That could be some music or relief to the government's ears. 
On to another exclusive now, Alok Industries, one of the largest defaulters from RBI's first ins insolvency list, may be heading into liquidation. In a surprising turn of events, CNBC TV18 now learns that the lenders have rejected the resolution plan that was offered jointly by Reliance Industry, Gen GM Financial Asset Reconstruction Company. They were the only ones to bid. Ritu, who actually broke that story, joins in with all the details now. Ritu, what does this really mean for Alok Industries and more importantly, the bankers who are involved? Take us to what you know. That's right, we understand from sources that the Committee of Creditors for Alok Industries has rejected the proposal offered by Reliance Industries together with JM Financial ARC in the meeting that concluded this morning at 10 a.m. We understand that the sole bidder in this case, which is Reliance and JM Financial, failed to secure the requisite 75% voting mark required for any resolution plan to be passed under insolvency and bankruptcy code. Only 70% of the voters, uh, of the lenders, we understand, voted in favor of the proposal whereas 30% dissented, saying that their 4,800 crore rupee offer for Alok Industries was too close to the liquidation value of the company, which is pegged at around 4,200 crore rupees. Now remember, Alok Industries is facing claims of over 29,400 crore rupees and it is likely that the company will head into liquidation because the 270-day deadline under IBC for Alok Industries ends in just a couple of days from now. So it will be a big hit or a big haircut that the lenders will have to take. Right, thanks a lot there, Ritu. Just a standard disclaimer now on your screens. Uh, Reliance Industries owns Network 18, which in turn owns the CNBC TV 18, the channel that you're watching. Well, on to a CNBC TV 18 exclusive interaction. In his first ever interview in India since taking over Nokia in 2014, President and CEO Rajiv Suri said that they hope to capture the opportunity in India with its next big bet on 5G. In a conversation with Kritika Saxena, Nokia's uh, global CEO also talked about how millennials are the major consumers of Nokia. Take a look. I think actually that uh, India is where our brand is probably loved the most. Hmm. Uh, and uh, HMD, have, have, no, mm. we as Nokia, in terms mm. of smartphones and yeah. overall feature phones, are, are doing yeah. very well. Mm. I mean, it was the first mm. year of operation for HMD Global last mm. year, if you think about it, right? Mm. And they said that it's 70 million phones. A large mm. part of it is still feature phones, but mm. also emerging very strongly in smartphones. Look at the number of phones we, mm. uh, we launched mm. during uh, both last year and, and 16. So, and you. Hmm. Th the fact is that a majority of the buyers are youth, people yeah, under absolutely. 35 years yeah. old. So you would have thought maybe that, okay, Nokia mm. exited at first, so maybe it's lost the cool factor, but not it so much. Millennials are buying. It hasn't. In so terms millennials of market are share buying. as well, I mean, because, because, you know, the Samsung, <coughs> if not Samsung, then OnePlus and Xiaomi's of the world, the low-cost phones of the world, are taking over to an extent. And, and, you know, I want to understand how that has changed the brand pop proposition over here. It's, I think, strengthened the brand proposition because it it's catering mm. to, like I said, a lot of the youth. Mm. Um, not just here, mm. but also around the world. Mm. All right, time for another break here on India Business Hour Plus. Up next, Rakesh Bharti Mittal of Bharti Enterprises take charge as the new president of CII. Kotak Mahindra Bank's Uday Kotak is the new president designate of the industry body. That story when we return. Very good evening and welcome back. Now, three years after SEBI directed cancellation of Sahara's mutual funds registration certificate, it has now asked the company to wind up all of its schemes. Yash Jaina joins us with more details. Uh, Yash, what are the instructions that SEBI has given uh, Sahara Mutual Fund in terms of closure of its schemes? Well, certainly a long pending order from the market regulator. SEBI today has directed Sahara Mutual Fund to wind up all its schemes by April 21st, 2018. There's, of course, a little bit of exception with just one scheme, uh, which is called Sahara Tax Gain Fund, which can also be only operational till July 27th and will also have to be wound up within a month thereafter. Remember, this case uh, dates back to 2015 when due to regulatory action against Sahara Group, SEBI had directed the cancellation of registration license of Sahara Mutual Fund 
saying that the promoters of the company are not fit and proper to run the mutual fund business. This order was, of course, then going forward challenged by the company before the Securities Appellate Tribunal, which then disposed of the matter, giving the company six weeks to appeal before the Supreme Court. Going forward, the Apex Court had also upheld market regulator SEBI's directive, and it's a result of that legal victory that SEBI today has reinforced its decision and its directive to ask Sahara Mutual Fund to bring an end to its mutual fund operations. All right, Yash, many thanks for that. Let's take a look at some of the other headlines that we've been tracking through the day. Harish Manwani will retire as the non-executive chairman of Hindustan Unilever after sp spending more than 40 years of the company. Sanjeev Mehta, the present MD and CEO, will be taking over as the chairman and managing director following the annual general meeting in June this year. Sanjeev Mehta has also been given another five-year term as the MD and CEO. All appointments are, of course, subject to shareholder approval in the upcoming AGM. Well, talking of leadership change, Rakesh Bharti Mittal of Bharti Enterprises has taken charge as the president of CII and Kota Mahindra Bank's Uday Kota is the new president-designate of the industry body. Addressing a press conference in the national capital, the business honchos sounded very optimistic about India's economic growth recovery. The rural demand has picked up and now they are spending. If you see uh, infrastructure with the government spending, steel, cement is doing very well. Auto. Two-wheelers, four-wheelers are doing extremely well. So clearly there are some sectors which are working very well. So clearly I, what I foresee now is that now the Indian industry will start its investment uh, cycle. If you look at the economy from 2014 to 2018, for the first three or four years, you saw a situation where macro India was getting better our current account, our fiscal deficit were all consistently improving over the last three or four years. But micro India was more challenging, especially for the first three years. What we are now seeing is a dramatic pickup in micro India across a whole host of sectors. Well, on that note, let's revisit one of the top stories of the day. The government is trying to soften the angel tax flow, and today the centre has notified the exemption mechanism for startups. Now, how is the industry looking at these developments? Keep in mind that there are a number of riders and caveats. Uh, Sina caught up with angel investors and startup founders to know more. Take a look. Celebrating 16 years of Young Turks. I'm going to be joined by guests in Bombay, Bangalore, and you're with me in Delhi as well. Uh, Nikuj uh, Bubna, who's the founder of Wowbox, joins us from Bombay. Ravi Gururaj, co-chair uh, of the VC Council at IVCA, joins us from Bangalore. Uh, Padmacha Rupural, president uh, Indian Angel Network, is with me in the Noida studio. And Mani Singhal, co-founder of Pi Ventures, joins us from Bangalore as well. So let me start with you, uh, Padnaja. Thanks for joining us. How do you read this latest uh, notification? Do you see it as one step forward but two steps back? Well, what it does tell me that the government uh, is trying to at least address this issue, which has been boiling for some time, as you said, from 2012. But it is a hard one. Having said that, I think... Um, Overall, if I look at this notification, it is providing one more big hurdle in the startup ecosystem uh, for a number of reasons, right? I don't think anywhere in the world has it worked that a valuation of a startup can be fixed by anybody else other than the entrepreneur and the investor. Otherwise, where would we have ever got a Google for that matter? Uh, I think the whole process that has been defined in today's notification which is taking it through the DIPP interministerial board, I think that's a big hurdle. Only less than 1% of the startups have been approved. How are we ever going to scale this up? Number three is that if we have investors who need to be vetted for their uh, uh, income and their uh, uh, net worth, I think that is another process which will stop or discourage investors from going into this asset class at all. So startups are going to find it extremely difficult. And last, I think uh, 
this is this doesn't look like a solution which is going to drive the startup industry okay. to the next level. Uh, so, uh, what do you make of this, Ravi? What are your key takeaways from the uh, notification today? Uh, let's start with if you see any positives in this at all, and what your mi mind are the red flags. So, I think you know what we've seen here is something that is going to slow down investments completely uh, because I think uh, you know investors are going to insist that. Uh, startups go get the uh, DIPP board approval first before they put their money in. And we don't know how long that will take. Uh, you need to get a merchant banker valuation first and foremost. That's quite onerous. Uh, you need to uh, basically certify all your accredited investors. And that onus falls, as I read the circular, on the startup. That's quite a lot of work uh, to do. Uh, the investors themselves might have to do some filings and things like that. Uh, and then you have to wait in line for that interministerial body uh, to meet and to approve. And as Padmaja said, uh, the rate there of uh, success through that gate has been quite low. Uh, so it means basically you're going to stifle a lot of angel investments across the board. And that's not a good situation. I think uh, I hope the DIPP will uh, revisit and take a look at uh, uh, this uh, this change and try and make it much less friction. It's an eminent uh, interministerial board that's been put together. Uh, prominent, you know, uh, yeah. people who hold uh, prominent offices will be there. But uh, how much do they really know uh, about the startup ecosystem, technology companies that might be uh, raising funds at, uh, you know, what might be seen as incredible valuations, right? Yeah. Uh, Manish, I want you to come in on this and then, of course, yeah. Padmaja as well. Absolutely. I mean, uh, they are not in the business of uh, questioning valuations of startups, etc. There are so many things which go into it. So I think it is it is more of a hurdle that a board has to approve such a thing. Uh, comparative, uh, comparatively, if we look at some other countries like Singapore, England, and uh, I think in Germany as well, there are incentives given uh, to angel investors to invest in startups. And here we are uh, totally on the other end where there is it's, it's becoming a pain actually to invest in startups at. A well, news from down south. It's day two of the DEF Expo 2018. Prime Minister Narendra Modi formally inaugurated the Defence exhibi Exhibition in Chennai today. He launched the Innovation for Defence Excellence Scheme and promised to set up defence hubs throughout the country. Remember, this Defence Expo is being attended by major international and domestic defence firms. CNBC TV 18's Jude Sarath brings us the highlights of day two. Day two of the Indian Defence Expo saw Prime Minister Narendra Modi in attendance. Prime Minister Modi, while speaking at the event, pointed out that his government had fulfilled 80% of its defence offset targets between the years 2014 and 2017. The Prime Minister also added the focus will now shift towards making Tamil Nadu and Uttar Pradesh future industrial defence corridors. We are committed to establishing two defence industrial corridors one right now here in Tamil Nadu and one in Uttar Pradesh. Back at the expo, aeronautics majors from across the world were keen to get cracking on the government's fighter jet RFI. Both Boeing and Saab said they were in with more than just a chance, with Boeing, HAL and Mahindra even forging a partnership to get the job done. We are currently analysing the uh, content of the RFI. So definitely, yes, that's something we're seriously looking into. We will also ensure that cost of production in the country comes down. We will be very strong contender. We believe we will be a leading contender for with a product which is excellent. But concerns surrounding Indian defence offsets continue to exist, with some companies saying the policy needs an overhaul. We find the offset rules a little bit problematic. They're quite strict in how they're enforced. The Indian offset rules say, I can only supply you something which I make. We're part of a big corporation. We have nearly 100,000 people. If I could tap all of the things that we make, we could offer more offset, more diverse products into the Indian industry. The offset policies that exist today are very restrictive and force us to work with not exactly the best people to work with. I'd like to see a broadening of where offsets can go to and how we can choose the partners we go with. So positivity and a call to action on the whole, but tempered with just a bit of caution. 
That was the mood at day two of the Indian Defence Expo. In Chennai, this is Jude Sanath. Uh, meanwhile, the government's aspirations to move towards 100% electrification of the Indian Railway seems to be on track. Friend giant Alstom has delivered the first e-locomotive from its plant in Madhepura in Bihar on schedule. As you may remember, this is part of the 3.5 billion euro order for 800 electric locomotives signed in 2015. CNBC TV 18's Ashpit Sethi and Arif Sherwani bring us the special report. And so the first electric locomotive from Alstom's Madhepura plant was handed over to the Indian Railways, marking the start of a brand new chapter in the Indian Railway story, that of electrification. According to the terms of the 3.5 billion euro contract handed out by the Indian Railways, this Alstom plant in Madhepura and Bihar, which is a 7426 joint venture between Alstom and the Indian Railways under the public-private partnership umbrella, will roll out 800 electric locomotives. So far, only phase one of this plant is complete. But Alstom says work is on track and production will pick up pace as more of the plant comes online. In a project like this one, it's always there are several phases. And one very critical phase, it is the validation test and the type testing of the prototype machines. And here the test will happen with a fleet of four, five, six prototype machines, which will be built during the year 2018. We have made the decision together with Indian Rail to make these prototypes totally in India in order to create a positive dynamic and to drag the full project directly from India instead of importing the prototypes from, our, from abroad. The mass production is under preparation in parallel and our plan with our partner Tata is clearly to complete the full factory by the end of this year and to ramp up the full production. And the production will start by end 2018, early 2019 with the full fledged delivery. Next year we plan to deliver around 50 locomotives. Globally 2022 is now, uh, say, is now three and a half years, four years from now. We can expect that we have roughly 500 locomotives running on the Indian network in commercial operations, plus more under manufacturing of course. Right, so then 500 locomotives yeah. by 2022, that's yeah. what you're looking yeah. at. Uh, so I wanted to understand, will you be looking at investing more in India in terms of another plant maybe because 800 locomotives is the kind of contract that you've signed with mm -hmm. India? So clearly, today, as I said, this plant has an overload capacity of 25%, so we can deliver 1,000 locomotives in the same time frame. Regarding the further investment, you see around of you, there is a lot of land still available, and in the mock-up I've shown you, we have an area reserved for a possible extension. All depends what will be the policy and the choice of our customer if they want to have more equipment manufactured here. We have to keep in mind also that this factory can manufacture other equipment than only this vague 12 machine. If, for instance, uh, Indian Rail decides to go for other technology or other products, the factory has the flexibility to accommodate it. There has been uh, some issues which have been raised by experts, if I may say. They are saying that most of the supplies that you're procuring are, f are being imported. They're not from local suppliers. Mm -hmm. So would you like to elaborate on that? Will we see a 100% purchase by Alstom from within Indian so clearly, in order to speed up and to make things fast, we have incorporated in our prototype locomotive imported components coming from other Alstom factories. But that's for the fleet of five, six prototypes, as I dictated to you. In parallel, and I would say that even for this fleet, our domestic content is 50 to 60 percent because the machines are assembled here in Madhepura. A lot of components are coming from our factory in south of India in Coimbatore, and a lot of components are coming from our established Indian vendors, and I give you one or two names, ABB, uh, Fevele, etc., etc., who traditionally support us in all what we do in the country. So we have already 50 to 60 percent import content in the machine standing behind you. We are in parallel working on plans to have full equipment coming from India with our vendors. And our target when we go for mass production is to have 80 to 90 percent of domestic content in our locomotives. Alstom says it's ready to begin delivering one locomotive every three days by 2019. And that's because of this increased localization, which bodes well for the Modi government's Make in India program. For Alstom, its role in the Indian Railway's electrification drive has already brought it new orders worth around 75 million euros, which include a power supply contract each from the Mumbai and Jaipur metros and an order for trains from the Chennai metro. With Ashpreet Sethi in Madhepura, in New Delhi, Arib Sherwani. 
Well, with that, it's a wrap on this edition of India Business Hour. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good night.